This is the first in a collection, I like to think of it, of videos about different synthesis techniques you can approach in Zoya. Um, it's a collection rather than a series because not everything will build off one another, be connected. And uh, it's also a collection because I'm trying to, to instead of doing hour-long gargantuan videos, try to make these sort of shorter, self-contained snippets, uh, nuggets, little niblets of, of things that you can apply. Uh, and I thought the perfect place to begin would be with pinged filters. So uh, this is a pinged filter that I'm playing here using this keyboard module. And a pinged filter can consist of two parts. One is an exciter, which is just a little burst of noise uh, or sound from an oscillator. Here I'm using a sawtooth oscillator and I'll get into uh, noise in a second. Um, the other is a resonating filter. So the idea is you can think of it kind of like an, any sort of resonating object, like a bell, right? If you hit a bell with a mallet, the bell rings out, uh, but the mallet doesn't really make the sound. It's the resonance of the bell, but the bell can't resonate without being struck by the mallet. So that's sort of the relationship between exciter, mallet, and uh, filter, bell. Um, so <clears throat> it has a very characteristic sort of plinky uh, sound, I would say. And this is the range you often hear these notes in, but I'm going to drop them for a second because you can get... So anyhow, that's what a pinged filter sounds like. So the exciter is pretty simple. Um, I've chosen two different exciters here just to show the difference between the two. And there are other varieties, although these are the classic exciters. One is a noise source and one is a sawtooth wave. I've tuned that up, uh, but I'll show the difference between different tunings in a second. Um, and then I just have those going into a switch so I can select between the two. We were listening to a sawtooth. This is a uh, noise. And you'll notice noise has this sort of percussive front end. Um, those go into a VCA and the VCA is opened here with the noise, I have it opened by the smallest possible setting. So both of these stages, this is an ADSR that's opening the VCA, and it, it's an attack decay mode. I've removed the sustain and release stages. We don't need them. We barely need uh, the attack and decay stages. We could, in fact, replace this with a trigger uh, pretty satisfactorily. And then for my own purposes, I have this going into a multiplier uh, before it hits the VCA. And the multiplier is going to take the curve of that envelope and make it from linear to more exponential. So it'll have a sort of sharper drop off. Now, in this case where we've just got the most minute amount of sound, that doesn't really matter a lot, but I'll show some use cases where it does. So from the VCA that's open just a fraction to let that sound through, it hits this filter. And this is a bandpass filter. You can use other types of filters. Uh, a low pass filter works pretty well. A high pass filter gets some very strange results, but it might be worth experimenting with. But the most traditional type of filter used for, for pinged filters is in fact a bandpass filter. Um, and I want to show one thing about the setup that's very important for this filter. In a recent firmware change, the filter uh, frequency change was given an option. The default was smooth. And smooth um, 
it introduces a, a slew, a slowing down of the change in filter frequency, which is useful. It makes it sound more organic for a lot of synthesis techniques like subtractive synthesis and a lot of ways that envelopes are applied to filters. But for our purposes, we want that frequency change to be instant so that when we change the note, uh, the filter's frequency changes in response because what we're really playing is the filter. The output of this keyboard goes to the filter's frequency, not to the oscillator. So we're not changing the oscillator frequency. We can't change the frequency of the noise. Those are static. What we're hearing is changes in the filter frequency and the resonance at that frequency. So it produces a very distinctive sound that is uh, akin to the sounds produced by uh, some pretty natural decays uh, from, you know, organic or acoustic instruments, which is part of the reason why pinned filters are, are very popular. Bell-like qualities, uh, you know, different tuned percussion sounds, that sort of thing. And the way that the filter sounds depends a lot on the resonance. So if we change the resonance, if we take it down all the way to one, we don't hear anything. You hear a little click, but that maybe if you're listening carefully you say oh that's kind of pitched but we need to increase the the resonance now we're getting a bit of a of a pitch sound but there's no decay it's just a little click but as we move this up that sound now has a decay and we've gotten into sort of percussive uh, tuned percussion sounds. And the further we go along, the more we get into bell or toy piano sort of sounds and the decay gets longer. So at a hundred, uh, not a hundred, at a thousand resonance, we get a sound like this. You know, and it has this, again, this sort of distinctive decay uh, and, and timbre. And that is the basics of ping filter. It's this exciter going into this resonating filter, and you can change... The, the filter's frequency determines the pitch that you hear. So if you were using a MIDI note in rather than a keyboard module, the note out would go to the filter frequency again, and the gate or trigger would go to the ADSR like normal. Um, but, you know, uh, this is a really simple synthesis technique to try out. And I'm going to go through a, a couple of minor variations here. You can do a lot, uh, particularly by playing around with different types of exciters or processing exciters, filtering them and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm going to go through two different ways that we can change our exciter pretty simply, and then we'll be done. Uh, the first one is to change the envelope. So there's a reason why I I didn't just use a trigger. I wanted to show some of the things that can happen with different envelopes. And with noise, you can get sort of woodwind breath sounds. You probably don't want the resonance quite that high. Right? You get a, a little bit of a flutish quality to that. Um, and if we switch over to the sawtooth wave, uh, there's another reason that sawtooths are used. If we have a longer decay envelope, we hear these little trills. And this is part of the reason why I wanted that exponential decay so that the amplitude of the sawtooths would die down in a way that, that made that trilling sound 
more natural. Uh, and if we change the frequency of the oscillator, those slow down because because the frequency determines how close the the sawtooth waveforms are to one another. And I'll I'll say, you know, with the noise oscillator, you can get a, with the noise source, you can get away with that very narrow pinged filter. If you try that with a sawtooth wave, you'll notice you'll get some variation and amplitude, and that's because the the narrowest uh, filter, or I'm sorry, the narrowest envelope is going to be smaller than the waveform of the sawtooth wave, so it'll catch it at different points, and that can be good or bad. You know, if you're patching something generative, you, you don't want it to always sound exactly the same in terms of intensity. So this is kind of a hidden boom. Uh, but if you open the, the decay or, or attack up a little bit more, you have to be careful. You don't want it to sound like it's trilling, but you can find a couple spots where you're right at about the length of a given waveform and it becomes a little bit more consistent. You'll still get some variations. Uh, and I'll just show one other option with this. And then I promise we'll be, we'll be done. If you use negative frequency for the oscillator, and keep in mind you can take oscillators below uh, 27.5 hertz if you apply negative uh, CV to them. If we take this lower, we get even more uh, space between these sort of repeated pings that happen because the sawtooth goes up and down. So it becomes sort of a delay effect. But, of course, if we go too far, we get into, you know, really subsonic areas. Uh, if you have on headphones, I can hear a very, like, low pulse that happens after that initial ping. But you don't get the sort of trilling. But you can play around with the frequency of the sawtooth wave. This is the reason why a sawtooth wave is the classic because a square wave won't produce this. It doesn't have that shape, right? It, it's just on off, but the sawtooth has already, you know, a, a disproportionate energy, right? It's got more energy at the beginning of the wave and then it trails off. Um, but you can use sines and triangles and that sort of thing and play around with them. The, the waveform is not particularly, you know, important, but it can add some slightly different timbral characteristics. So again, if you have some different attack parameters, you can get these sort of trilled sounds. And that may be something you want to, you know, play around with we push this up. I'm going to cut out that part. Uh, you know, if you go too high in the frequency, you're going to end up with a, a very loud noise because the uh, filter will start to pick up uh, some of the harmonics of the wave and amplify them. Um, so probably about a1 is about as high as you want to go. Uh, but that is the pinged filter. I'll publish this patch when I publish the video, so you can follow along or pick it apart if you want. Um, but yeah, it's a really simple way to add a different type of synthesis to your sounds. Um, it's pretty CPU light as things go. Uh, if you're doing more than one pinged filter, you need your own VCA and ADSR and 
and filter, but you don't need these sound sources because, again, they're not pitched or tuned or anything like that. So they can connect to different BCAs around a patch and, and uh, do what they're going to do. So, yeah, that's pinged filters. Uh, I'll see you next time. I'm going to talk about, I said this wasn't going to be a series, but the next thing I think I'm probably going to talk about is modal synthesis, which is an outgrowth of this idea. So I'll see you then, if not before. Take care.